Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our IVF webinar on this Friday evening. I'm glad that you are here with us, and I'm sure you have lots and lots of questions to ask. But and as always, of course, we will uh, answer your questions after uh, the presentation. As you can see, our IVF expert is with us already, Dr. Liana Dorofayeva uh, from Ivy Med uh, Clinic uh, located in Lviv. And uh, Dr. Liana, it's great to, be, uh, to have you back as always, and I hope you are having a good day and so thank you so much for joining us tonight as well. How are you feeling? Thank you, Caroline. I'm great uh, and it's always great to be with you, to be with your patients and uh, as you know, I share your goal and your initiative and I appreciate this opportunity to talk to the patient, to discuss different topics and to be in one communication and one understanding with our patients as I like them to be aware of what is going on, what we are going to plan, what we are going, what is possible to be done. And uh, this gives an opportunity to believe in that more is possible and they still continue moving into their goals. So this is yes. why I'm here and I'm uh, and thank are... that you are doing this as well. We are so very happy that you are with us. Your presentations are always thorough and are always, and we always have um, very interesting questions. So, as you can see, our topic tonight is definitely not an easy one. It's an explain infertility, and of course, Dr. Liana will definitely try to um, explain all those details. You can be sure uh, she has prepared a very interesting uh, with lots of information presentation so uh, let's start with the presentation and as i mentioned afterwards remember it will be time for your questions uh, so don't uh, don't hesitate go ahead and ask your questions you can do it of course uh, during the presentation and later on as well and yeah let's go ahead with the presentation okay dr liana yes sure wonderful let's go so we are talking today about the unexplained infertility, about its definition, diagnosis and prospects. Actually, this diagnosis and definition is quite old and um, we consider it unexplained infertility as infertility what is idiopathic in the sense of that cause remains unknown even after an infertility workup. However, as this is, as I said, all definition, this workup of infertility included only seminal analysis, assessment of ovulation and fallopian tubes for the woman. However, uh, and most of the clinicians and physicians, they uh, define this as uh, unsustainable and highly subjective definition and diagnosis. And I really hope that uh, you, as being a patient, haven't received this kind of diagnosis. And also, you haven't been uh, advised that the cause remains unexplained after the negative um, IVF treatment or IVF attempt. Because uh, this means, and I absolutely um, uh, accept this definition, that unexplained infertility means that the physician was not able to find the real cause of your infertility. And we need to perform deeper testing, wider screening. Um, we, we need to understand that if it's still unexplained, meaning that which tests have been for performed are not complete, Probably some of the tests were not available in the clinic or in the country. And we will talk about these limitations a lot during our today's webinar. Uh, we need to understand what was the quality of those tests and who performed the evaluation of the tests. And also that the diagnostic workup was incomplete or of a poor quality. And also there are some levels of what needs to be considered in the very beginning of the or during the initial stimulation cycle or initial embryo transfer and what needs to be added as additional testing or methods after we had already IVF treatment and it was negative. Talking simple, we need to have two main things. Uh, good endometrium, good meaning receptive, thick 
triple lining on the period of the uh, ovulation and changed into the homogeneous receptive endometrium in the timing of implantation and euploid high quality blastocyst. But also, this is not complete question and answer of what else needs to be done and what else these are immunological factors we, we discuss a lot with the professionals and some consider this as being um, really important some do not consider them as really important but our practical experience says that this really works and we will talk about these factors as well or this could be genetic factors as an issue of why pregnancy was not was not achieved or factors related to an oocyte sperm or embryo itself but the most important for most of our patients the causes are multifactorial we should not stop in case we just received one cause and we decided that this is an issue and we need to treat the infertility according to considering this cause as a main one or the only one. And if we started the treatment and we did not achieve the pregnancy, we need to understand that, that probably they missed something and we need to think wider and we need to understand what else can play the role of why this was not achieved. Another issue, this is, or starting from the very beginning, let's start from the endometrium and the uterus. Normal endometrium, this is more than seven millimeters endometrium on the, and receptive endometrium on the timing of implantation. Once we are starting the preparation of the patient for IVF, we need to consider the endometrium cavity and in case any abnormalities are founded, for example, as endometrial polyps, we need to remove them. We need to recommend hysteroscopy to be performed and treatment to be provided. As well as hyperplastic endometrium. Uh, unfortunately, I have seen few cases of considered by the doctors uh, thick nice looking endometrium of 16 or 17 millimeters however we need to understand that this sick endometrium is hyperplastic endometrium this is histologically unhealthy endometrium and also such uh, status of endometrial cavity needs to be treated and such endometrium which is abnormal needs to be removed as well as the reproductive surgeon needs to uh, consult and treat patients with Usherman syndrome, we need to understand of how uh, good would be the cavity after the treatment of the Usherman's syndrome and the Senechia will be performed. It should be a trial to treat this. If not, we need to recommend a surrogacy treatment. However, for most of the, of the surgeons right now, there are technologies and the possibilities to treat this successfully. Myomas are different in their localization and um, uh, sizes. However, also after the preliminary treatment before the IVF cycle, for many patients with myomas, with high quality and euploid embryo, we are still receiving an implantation. There is an issue which we need to control during the pregnancy care and the first and the second trimester during the pregnancy and the whole pregnancy in general. However, as well as for the adenomyosis with high quality embryos for most of the cases, pregnancy is still uh, possible. Protocols for endometrial preparation are different and we need to achieve, as I said on the beginning, endometrium of seven millimeters and more for the proper and successful implantation. There is natural cycle uh, which requires endocrine monitoring and ultrasound evaluation and measurements of the LH uh, levels uh, very um, often. We, we don't use natural cycle for the preparation of endometrium, even not modified natural cycles. We prefer to use uh, hormonal replacement protocols even for endometrial preparation with the pituitary suppression once uh, to, and to prevent the endogenous surge 
of LH hormone causing luteinization and progesterone exposure. So we are more flexible and also patient is more flexible. And um, there are a lot of uh, statistical data saying that this kind of endometrial preparation gives higher implantation chances for the patients and uh, is more successful. What if after the proper and well-evaluated endometrial preparation, we are facing the syndrome of thin endometrium? Why it's happening? It usually happens due to resistance to estrogens, damage of the basal scarp, decreased blood flow or overexposure to testosterone. Such syndrome needs to be treated and we are treating this with um, uh, two options. Either the growth factor for treatment of the thin endometrium is recommended and it's, it showed also um, high successful um, uh, evaluation and the efficiency. We also did our own study for treatment of the thin endometrium using granulosa growth factor. Uh, 30 patients were included. For all of them, sickness of endometrium was less than seven millimeters. They were between their age of 30 to 48 years old. Only good quality embryos were uh, selected for transfer based only on the morphological conditions, not including the genetic testing. At least two negative outcomes those patients had in the past. They had resistance seen in endometrium and we performed intrauterine administration of 30 milligrams of granulo growth factor into the uterus. And we have seen that the thickness of endometrium was uh, higher for three millimeters in comparison to the previous uh, uh, protocols with the endometrial preparation and implantation was uh, higher for this group of the patients. Also, but for some patients, growth factor was not working. So we tried as an alternative of uh, platinum rich plasma, PRP, uh, as also a treatment option for thin endometrium. We selected a group of 38 patients who had canceled cycle due to non-appropriate endometrial thickness in their previous cycles, and also we included those patients who had no reaction for growth factor treatment. We randomized that group into two groups. 20 were injected with the PRP and 18 were a control group. The first step was preparation of the platinum rich plasma. It always prepares from the patient's blood. We used 15 milliliters of blood performed centrifugation and selected only the, the part of the platinum rich plasma. And as a second step, as soon as uh, material was prepared, we injected one milliliter of it into the uterus. We performed two injections uh, on day 10 and 12, or, or 12 on estrogen administration, and also on day one of progesterone and we measured the thickness on day of the RCG after 48 hours and on the day of the embryo transfer. Criteria for evaluation were initial for increasing thickness of endometrium and the final achieving the clinical pregnancy. So we even found it that results were better in that group of the patients as increase of the thickness of the endometrium was for three millimeters for the group of the pregnant woman and 2.8 as average in the group of those women who were not pregnant. And we need to understand that also the embryos which were transferred, they were not evaluated with the PGS testing. These were only were morphologically selected good quality embryos. So, and implantation was 50% for those patients who, for whom PRP was injected in comparison to 15 only in the group of patients with um, no PRP. Also, we know now much more about the implantation. Also about the end of implantation and then embryo maternal crosstalks. There are a lot of publications and there is different reaction of endometrium into a good quality and poor quality embryos. 
And this is additional proof to that fact that having those possibilities for evaluation of our embryos, we should not transfer just every embryo which we receive in our laboratories. We should not transfer the three embryos. We should not transfer poor quality blastocysts. We should consider only highest quality embryos because by doing this, we, we still can do this. But we are giving a false hope for our patients that there is a potential for this treatment, success for this treatment. That's why we are in our practice, we are using uh, thorough evaluation of the embryos all new techniques which are possible for uh, embryo investigation and this gives the best results. We will talk about this further. Regarding the window of implantation, there is a specific time frame during which endometrium has maximum sensitivity to embryo implantation. It usually lasts for 48 hours and we expect this to be six to eight days after the ovulation or for hormonal replacement cycles, we consider this to be synchronic with the blastocyst development, meaning between day five to seven of the blastocyst development. This is once our blastocysts are uh, well expanded and they are ready to be transferred, endometrium also should be ready. And we investigate this by uh, checking the pinopodius. This is a special tissue, which you can see in the graphs um, uh, here, that they need to be mature and well-developed. They are not developed until the window of implantation is open, and they are already um, decreasing and, and going out once uh, they are old, uh, getting older. Uh, and there is no function of the spinopodias anymore. Also, there is an endometrial receptive array. This is a more um, deeper, let's say, test, but very similar in terms of understanding the receptivity. It's based on the evaluation of genetic chip of expression of 238 genes, which are responsible for endometrium receptivity. For our patients, we do both, however, the uh, um, electronic microscopy showing just the pinopodias and their maturation and development, we use more as this is more simple test. We can do this in our location, in our clinic, and it's also cheaper. So we perform endometrial preparation in the hormonal replaced cycle, uh, perform pipal endometrial aspiration on day 6, 8, and 10 from the progesterone administration. Why we move this into further? So 6 is the beginning, because for most of the patients who have so-called moved window of implantation, it moved into the day 8 or 9 or 10. Just for some, and this is more or less even than 5% of the patients who have moved this to be earlier than day six. Uh, but we can also see this if we see that the pinopodiers are already decreasing and getting older on day six. And then scanning electronic microscopy of endometrial specimens uh, was performed to assess the presence and the maturity of the pinopodiers. In these pictures, you can see that pinopodiers are well developed um, uh, on day eight of progesterone. This is on the mid in the middle picture here. In this uh, picture, for example, you can see that on day six there is uh, just uh, just very few and very small one pinopodiers. On day eight, they are just starting to grow, but they are still not mature. So this is not the timing of the proper implantation. And on day 10, we only can see nice looking pinopodias. So this means that this is a timing for the implantation. And for example, if we would consider that patient and we are transferring her blastocyst on day six or seven of progesterone and embryo will live only for, for as maximum 48 hours inside of our uterus and will have the potential to be implanted. But the pinopodias will start growing only on day nine for this specific patient. So of course, this will be asynchronization 
and we will not be in the window of implantation. And once transferring embryos on day six, we would just lose those embryos and we will never get pregnant for, for such a patient. And uh, without um, evaluation of the window of implantation, transferring even euploid embryos, even the highest quality embryos, checking all the other factors, we would say that cause is still not here. So we still don't know what is the cause and we will say this is unexplained, this is idiopathic, like there is no, no reason for this. So transfer with respect to window of implantation is called personalized embryo transfer. And also we did a complex evaluation of those personalized embryo transfers starting from 2018 uh, and we evaluated transfers of 114 women with one to six failed attempts uh, before. Age of the patients was between 28 to 46 years. Uh, we only selected good quality embryos. However, we are not using any others in our practice, of course. Uh, for those patients who are over 42, we use donor oocytes uh, for creation of the embryos. Pinopodias that were obtained on day six, eight, and 10 of progesterone in the hormonal replaced cycle. Uh, and percentage of abnormalities in that group was 72% of implantation window being asynchronic. All patients underwent personalized transfer and pregnancy was obtained for 58 women in that group. So 70% of the patients with previous non-successful embryo transfers got pregnant after performing personalized embryo transfer and evaluation of their uh, endometrium and, their, and the receptivity of it. Another very interesting and important question is the immunological assessment. Uh, back in 1995, this was the first publication for immunological uh, diagnosis and testing and treatment for the infertile patients. And after that, it was the first book called Is Your Body Baby Friendly? Uh, as I said, there is still huge uh, and very, like, I would say, busy discussion regarding the immune um, response of the patient about uh, NCAS cells, which are different in the peripheral blood and in the urine, and they have, they have different functions. And that not obviously that if we are testing um, immunological uh, status of the patient, by assess, access, uh, understanding the peripheral uh, level and volume of the NCAS cells, we need to consider this as a um, um, patient to be dedicated for the IVAG treatment, for example. However, in our practical experience, and, and also the discussion is also due to the fact that many countries, they are not allowed to use IVIG for IVF. It is not written in the instruction. It is not um, a, a clinical experience. It needs to be confirmed and there is no evidence. However, from another hand, also IVF being done in the way it was done almost 50 years ago was first time done as a clinical experience. And after that, it was successful. So we just need to understand that what is working and we need to consider this for each and every patient. We are going to have next webinar in May, I think, talking specifically about immune testing and treatment, and I would share our experience. But in general, I would say that we, for those patients who potentially could have, or we consider their uh, medical history as those which we need to think about immunological um, infertility, we would recommend testing for them as an immuno immunological test and Cassell's level, autologous antibodies, Hashimoto, for example, Ashley, etc. And we would recommend IVIG treatment, intralipids or prednisolone. And this really works uh, well and uh, there is high efficiency for those group of the patients. Also talking about the oocyte quality. Uh, we all know that the poor oocyte quality is one of the main causes of uh, reproductive failures. 
in assisted reproductive treatment and quality of eggs. Now we know this is also quite new knowledge that quality of the eggs is mainly determined by the small organelles named mitochondria, which are also energy suppliers of the cell, uh, which are present in the cytoplasma of the cell. Also, we know a lot about morphological, cellular, and molecular predictors of the oocytes. And the main causes of the poor egg quality, of course, is an age, diminished ovarian reserve, genetic factors, endometriosis, and the mitochondria, and mainly um, mitochondrial DNAs uh, changed. Uh, once we have an aged oocyte and the mitochondrial dysfunction, we are going to have uh, lower IVF success rates, lower fertilization, higher aneuploidy rates of the embryos. And the main solution and very easy and simple one and also very effective is an oocyte donation. We perform, and uh, frankly speaking, in my experience with uh, the patients, this is probably number one uh, frequency of the IVF treatment cycles which we are performing. This is oocyte donation. Also because our patients uh, are in their age over 35 and up to uh, 45, 46, uh, even older as in Ukraine, there is no upper limit for the IVF treatment. However, we still consider medical indications, medical risks um, and ethical issues in terms of uh, planning the, the IVF treatments. Uh, but still, oocyte donation is very effective and uh, being involved in the Ovogen Egg Bank, which is um, an egg bank with the extended egg donor catalog, offering also oocytes being sent globally into different countries. And specifically, this is very important in the era of COVID, that patients should not travel. We can travel biological materials. Um, we, we need to consider this as very effective treatment. In our practical experience for the clinic and for the bank, we perform strict and very deep evaluation of morphological parameters of each oocyte from the donor, including um, all, all morphology which can be assessed right now and everything the, the science knows about the oocytes. But also we are offering a unique technology of genetically certified oocytes. And this is an oocyte which, for which we do NGS-based aneuploidy screening, uh, also a carrier screening for, donor, for donors, and the testing of a male partner of the, in, in a couple in order to understand that the created embryo will have no genetic risks for the potential baby, at least for this number of the mutations. And this is over 350 mutations, which we are testing. How it is performed uh, and why it is important to genetically screen the oocyte. Uh, the genetic structure of oocyte directly affects the pregnancy success rate. A neoplody of the embryos will reduce pregnancy success and will lead to the chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, we can analyze, and this is a publication since 2009, that one third, even from donor oocytes, which we uh, retrieve from young, uh, uh, healthy, with the proven uh, fertility for Ukraine, uh, female group of the donors, they will have genetic errors. And probably this is a statistic which, which just needs to be accepted because our body is not producing all the cells being absolutely ideal. And this is, um, we, we need to understand this figure and we need to accept this. Even with that figure, uh, we have oocyte donation treatment with the success rate of over 60%. And this is uh, everywhere as well as in our clinic. However, if we can avoid this, we will even get to the higher results. And the unique feature of the female uh, gamut of the oocyte 
is the, that the polar body can provide genetic information about the status of the oocyte and detect chromosomal or genetic abnormalities which may be inherited by the offspring. Uh, and this testing will give us a big advantage to avoid mitochondrial mutation risks while we will be fertilizing only euploid oocytes. And the advantages of the polar body NGS testing from the patient perspective is the fact that the oocyte donation program mostly brings financial responsibilities for patients and each oocyte looks as a potential embryo from the patient perspective. And once we will provide euploid oocytes, we will have the highest chances to achieve uh, high quality blastocyst of course, we need to understand the sperm factor as well. However, in the general population, in the number, we would have the highest possible blastocyst outcome. Most of the oocyte donation programs in, in different locations, they do not require NGS or PGS testing uh, of the oocyte or the embryo before the embryo transfer. But we would recommend to do this in order to maximize the chances of the patient. As well as we provide uh, and we recommend to perform NGS testing of the oocytes also for our patients, not only for the donors. Uh, why we started to recommend this? Of course, after the evaluation and we did the polar body biopsy um, of the of 1,978 oocytes, so almost 2,000 oocytes, and um, we vitrified them, and the results of the NGS testing was that 75 almost percent of those oocytes were euploid. So 25% of those oocytes coming from the cohort of young and healthy women were un-euploid. But, uh, and we need to understand that we are dividing our patients into two groups. One group is those for whom we potentially can receive mature and healthy oocyte and with the healthy nucleus. We understand that this group will be uh, in their advanced maternal age potentially, but still we can work with this genetic material. And that's why the oocyte donation really has an alternative. Uh, and another group would be a group of the patients who are not producing oocytes already, and we need just to accept this. Of course, we will uh, recommend the best stimulation protocol. We will talk and evaluate previous stimulation protocols, medications which were recommended, um, dosage, for example, for all patients in their advanced maternal age, we need to um, combine medications with the LH uh, as well, because this works well for the receptors and will give us higher results in terms of the recruitment of the follicles and also their growth and the maturation. But uh, the alternatives are those that mitochondria degeneration will decrease women's chances to get pregnant, uh, and uh, if we have mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, it causes the lack of the energy, which doesn't allow embryos to sustain fertilization. In this case, we can solve the mitochondrial degeneration by giving a chance to repair a nuclear function inside of the oocytes. And each couple have social and the genetic right to carry up their own genes during the pregnancy. Egg donation is always an easy alternative to achieve pregnancy, but still there are psychological and ethical thoughts around this procedure and they need to be considered both by the clinicians and the patients. So the alternatives which we are offering right now is a spindle transfer and the pronuclear transfer. The spindle is, um, is the, the, the structure inside of the cytoplasma which helps uh, the cell chromosome to be shared equally. Uh, and it is very important, it has a very important role for the cell division uh, and for the genetic potential of the oocyte. Uh, we can determine spindle only by special software and polarized system on the microscope. 
there are very limited number of the clinics using this in the world. System needs an experience of the embryologist and also high investment. Uh, we can do spindle, we are doing spindle transfer by the replacement of the entire cytoplasm of poor quality oocytes. We transfer the spindle, which consists uh, the genetic material from the egg of the older woman into the donor eggs with the healthy cytoplasm uh, and also the spindle removed. Uh, the eggs which are resulting from this procedure with the repaired cytoplasm can be inseminated by conventional technique, which is ICSI, with the sperm of the partner's partner, and will give uh, the intended parents a chance of having a child genetically related to them. It also helps to treat mitochondria diseases. Um, it already have been tested on human eggs and method, to, and it led to the development of blastocysts. Uh, it requires a uh, uh, special education for the embryologist and also practical experience, which we already have in our clinic. The pronuclear transfer uh, consists of performing in vitro fertilization using the oocytes of uh, affected women, which uh, with mitochondria contained uh, con content mut mutated DNA and the sperm of the future father. Um, and after the fertilization is performed, we extract the pronucleus on day one of development and transfer them into the cytoplasma of the donor oocyte, which been before enucleated. So we took pronucle from the donor eggs and we put pronuclear from the contained the nuclei of the mother and the father. Uh, and the hybrid zygote then developed in vitro until it reached the stage of the blastocyst. It's better in terms of the fact that we already have fertilized zygotes and we are transfer them as fertilized. So we know more predictors in terms of the further development of the blastocyst and there is no risks of fertilization because transfer is already between the zygotes. It, there is better blastocyst outcome. Uh, it also will help to treat serious mitochondrial disease but also will will answer the question and will give a chance for those patients who are in their advanced maternal age but still are producing their oocytes technique is mechanically requests micro manipulations and experience also a special cultivated method during the micro manipulations the results which were achieved uh, the total number of oocytes for these techniques was 177 uh, and uh, important is to get a blastocyst rate after a spindle transfer it's 77 percent and after the nuclear transfer 74 percent and we need to consider this as for the patients with in their advanced maternal age with uh, potential without these procedures to provide embryos not more than 20 percent so this is the difference and this is the rate of the genetic abnormalities which we consider and we have this published for many many years until we started to practice the the mitochondrial and the and pronuclear uh, transfer so for patients over 35 to 39 percent we would expect 50 percent of gen genetic abnormalities mainly due to mitochondrial DNA, as well as we understand right now, between 40 to 42%, 70%, and over 42%, 85% of the embryos would be uneuploid. And uh, transferring uneuploid embryos, as I said already before, uh, this is a giving a false hope to our patients that there is a potential for successful outcome because there is not. So the options which we would recommend and we do in our practical experience, this is oocyte and GS testing. Uh, and mainly we perform this for the donors because for the patients, we recommend to perform already fertilization and embryo cultivation and uh, test embryos which we would receive but not test uh, just initially oocyte. However, this is also still possible. Um, 
why we are talking about this? Because this is very limited technique. We, there was a uh, allowance in the UK to perform this kind of techniques and also not every clinic, if we are talking about all these issues, including uh, implantation potential and testing of the window of implantation, including IVIG um, uh, treatment, including all kinds of alternatives for outside donation and even outside donation itself. Uh, in the whole IVF world, it's very limited. And uh, we are lucky to practice in Ukraine. I always told this. Uh, and um, we used to receive many, many patients from all over the globe being treated in Ukraine. Of course, this was until a year ago. And now we are in the process of the, the COVID limitations. Still patients are coming even right now in Ukraine because we are trying to limit number of our visits and um, as maximum this is two. And for many patients for different kinds of treatments, this is one visit. Um, and this is very short period of staying in Ukraine. And of course, we are doing a lot of our communications uh, online, but uh, so far telemedicine cannot provide embryo transfer <laughs> or hopefully. So that's why still it is possible to, to be consulted or to get a second opinion or to get uh, treated with us in Ukraine. Also understanding those limits uh, and even before that, back starting in 2008, in my practical experience, there was um, an opportunity and we did this successfully to transfer embryos or oocytes or sperm from different countries to us into our facility to provide those treatments which needed or create uh, or get oocytes, donor oocytes, for example, or create embryos and send them back into the clinics. And you can see those locations. Uh, last year, we also added Australia. So there is no geographical limits right now, not for our donor oocytes. And we are compliant with all regulations and requirements, uh, not to, for the embryos. Uh, as well as even for pronuclear transfer, we can receive zygotes from your clinic. We can do pronuclear transfer for those frozen zygotes there. Uh, and then you can come just for the embryo transfer into Ukraine. So many things we can discuss. And the transportations uh, is allowed. There are very clear international regulations for the uh, transport of cryopreserved materials. This can be done either in a, with the supervision of the medical courier for some countries, even right now, or for some, this can be cargo, but there are rules for this, and this is really safe, and we practice this a lot. So the question is when to stop. If you are thinking to stop, so there are very limited possibilities for this, I would say. So these are medical consideration or to stop trying something and to change uh, the treatment uh, protocol. For example, stop trying using your oocytes and change into donor oocytes. Stop trying embryo transfers for you and start uh, surrogacy treatment. So these should be medical considerations and better to get a second opinion um, about this. There is an age limit, but also for different countries, this is a different age limit and the limits for treatment in a specific country, which we just mentioned about. I really like, this is a publication of an uh, Israeli group, and this is a unique country which is covering uh, all treatments until family has three children born um, and they published the data that uh, if there would be unlimited free IVF cycles so 95.5 percent of couples would get pregnant and this is very promising the issue is that uh, unfortunately not all of us and our patients have unlimited free IVF attempts um, and another data coming from UK uh, for uh, more than 150,000 women, for more than 250,000 IVF cycles, you can see also the statistics how the, the pregnancy potential increases with the number of the trial. But also 
if we would uh, think about uh, cause, if we would um, work to avoid this cause and uh, or multiple causes, we would get closer there, faster, and we would be more effective in terms of receiving our clinical pregnancy. So I absolutely agree. We probably were not um, touching each and every step, but I believe that these were the most important steps for those um, um, for those cases when we can say that this is unexplained factor. So this is additional to, to wider your knowledge of what else uh, we can think about or what else can be recommended. But I agree absolutely with uh, quite well known in the US, Dr. Norbert Glacier, that unexplained infertility generally means that physician failed to find the true cause of your infertility. And in our clinic, we never, like any patient receive that kind of treatment and um, I would like you would not receive this as well. So to conclude, diagnosis of um, unexplained infertility is unsustainable and highly subjective. Different treatment options may be recommended in IVF to achieve a goal of parenthood. There are various implantation factors which needs to be considered. Second opinion is recommended due to specific limits in the countries and options being uh, practiced there. The most effective treatment for patients in advanced age is OSI donation. Experimental treatment available in IVF are effective and may be accepted widely in the future. Genetically certified OSI is advanced technology which is offered by exclusively so far by Ovogen Egg Bank to increase chances of uh, euploid blastocyst outcome and pregnancy chance. Polar body biopsy does not affect OSI morphology or survival rate for vitrification or sewing. Genetically tested OSI has significantly better euploid blastocyst and implantation outcome. Uh, and if you are listening this webinar and haven't tried all the mentioned above, you should still keep trying. And we would do everything to think differently, to gather all decisions together and the previous experience and to achieve a pregnancy uh, in the first cycle or as soon as possible by recommending something else and uh, thinking wider. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. You have my contact details. You can also can contact uh, if uh, we will not have chance to talk here. And I will be happy to, to communicate and to coordinate any activities together with you. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for, as I've mentioned, I knew it's going to be interesting, of course. So thank you so much for this lovely presentation with lots and lots of details, useful ones. And that's the most important part here. And yes, you are very right. Uh, we have some questions already, um, plenty of questions, to be honest. So let's uh, get to the questions straight away. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let me have a look at the very first one uh, mm -hmm. from Margie. When is a blastocyst of high quality? Uh, high quality blastocyst can be achieved on day five or day six. However, there are many publications that day six blastocyst has lower potential in comparison to day five blastocyst. And I was a co-author in one of these uh, quite a big um, uh, data in our, and our clinic also participated for the OSI donation as well. So really day five has the best potential for the implantation and there is a grading system by A, B and C um, and also the grading by one, two, three, four, five by Gardner. There are some different methods to evaluate by the Gardner is the most commonly used internationally uh, so day five, this is day of the advanced and high quality blastocyst. Also grade A is the best. Some clinic would uh, consider to put 2A, meaning AA is the best. AB is uh, also high quality. However, there is some disorders already, but they are also, it's very... Um, 
like different embryologists would consider this differently. That's why there are a lot of machine learning right now and artificial intelligence is starting to be used in order to evaluate those embryos. However, if this is day five AA and advanced blasted cyst, meaning three, grade three or four, this is the best embryo. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the explanation to the very first question. And let's have a look at the next one that we have here from Karen. When you mention how the endometrium lining should be during ovulation and embryo transfer, what should change during this time and what should we look for? So it is great to perform an, an evaluation of the endometrial lining during the follicular phase and then during the ovulation and the luteal phase. We can do this in a natural cycle and the best lining and right line, right change would be that we would see a triple lining nicely growing until the ovulation time. And during the ovulation time, it's already over at least seven millimeters or uh, wider and it's triple. So we can see uh, very, uh, clear uh, white line between inside of the endometrium. We call this triple line endometrium. And then as soon as we started luteinization, so corpus luteum started to, to um, perform a LH surge uh, and then progesterone raised up. So we would see lining being white, more homogeneous. So it changes into the second phase. Uh, and it keeps it being wider. Also, it is very important that since the ovulation in a natural cycle or why we do administration of progesterone, that we would not have this short, short lutein, uh, luteal phase mm -hmm. means also that implantation may fail because there would be not enough time for the proper implantation. That's why there should be progesterone supplementation at least for 14 days after the ovulation. And thank you so much. Yet another answer to, to a great question indeed. And now we will have two parts of the question, okay? So let me just show mm -hmm. you the first part. So how is pinopodes tested? What should the level of the pinopodes be? And is the pinopodes tested in the transfer cycle or a prior cycle? If prior, is this likely to be the same timing in the future months? And let me go to the previous one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we perform pinopodia testing by electronic microscopy. Uh, we do this always in the hormonal replacement cycle, meaning that the next cycle, if we uh, follow the same protocol. So we do agonist uh, injection uh, before the the, the, uh, the menstrual cycle. Then we are starting menstruation. We start estrogen supplementation. We continue this for 10 to 12 days until we have proper thickness of endometrium. And then we start progesterone. And then at the same day, on day 6, 8, and 10, we do a pipal biopsies and we send this directly to the uh, laboratory to perform uh, uh, the, the scanning. And we see, we are getting the pictures which I showed during my presentation and there is no level of the um, pinopodius. There is just their presence or absence or they are too young or they are mature or they are too old. By evaluation this, we understand when specifically we have a window of implantation and we do testing in the cycle before we do an embryo transfer. So we cannot, because we are inside the uterus, we are doing the pipal, so we cannot transfer embryo in, this, in the same uh, cycle. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. And let me just have a look. Yes, there was a thank you from Karen for the explanation. And let's have a look at the next question. Can you guarantee live birth with the frozen eggs when buying lots of eggs? What factors of the may need to be considered? Do you accept TESA for a clinic in Australia or other countries? Or is it best to send the eggs to Australia, have TESA, then send embryos back after NGS for surrogacy? Uh, great question. Thank you. Uh, so I will start from the guarantee. 
we have a guarantee of the pregnancy in case we are creating blastocysts in our facility. However, uh, the TESA sperm, we do not consider this, the, the sperm factor also we have criteria regarding the uh, total mortal count and the morphology um, percentage of normal morphology sperm and also DNA fragmentation level for these guarantees of the live birth. Uh, unfortunately, TESA sperm would not be there for the live birth guarantee or clinical pregnancy guarantee because we can guarantee live birth in the surrogacy treatment, but in egg donation, we can guarantee only clinical pregnancy uh, because uh, the older woman, if there is a pregnancy uh, period, there are other risks than, um, than related to infertility. Mostly they are related to the somatic status of the patient. That's why we do not guarantee um, live birth for if the pregnant woman is the patient and mainly if this is an older patient. Um, so TESA sperm can be accepted in our uh, laboratory but we need to communicate prior to this and to understand uh, still the, the number of the sperms inside, the quality, the reason, etc. Uh, however, it would not be with the quarantine. But all those complicated cases, we communicate together with our laboratory manager and myself, for example, and we would evaluate this specific case and we will uh, definitely give our uh, conclusion what would be the best in this uh, in this case. Um, also, embryos can be sent for surrogacy also from Australia. And I would say that right now, this is the most common uh, option that now not patients are coming to Ukraine for treatment, unfortunately, uh, but embryos are coming. All right, that's great to, to hear then, of course. Thank you so much for definitely a few questions in one, but definitely interesting. And of course, for your help. And let's have a look at the next question. Do you offer immune testing at your clinic? Yes, we do. Uh, we do testing in the laboratories. We have an immunogram. We have all kinds of antibodies because this is a, um, a basic for us. Uh, to make a decision regarding um, IVIG treatment. We do not have intralipids in Ukraine uh, being registered. That's why, but we have great IVIG, really great. This is Ukrainian producer, a company which also produces the, um, uh, the, the blood factors, uh, even being exported outside. Um, so, and we, we already have been working with them since 2010. This is when they started the factory in Ukraine. We were very, like, um, uh, checking this very carefully on the very beginning, but now we trust absolutely. Uh, and in terms of the costs, uh, also the costs of Ukrainian IVIG in comparison to the cost, for example, in Ireland or in the UK, it's absolutely different for sure. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for yet another um, question. And now let's have a look at the uh, next one from Angela. What is the maximum age of intended mother for pronuclear transfer, uh, spindle transfer? I guess what is the ideal AMH? Anything else to consider? Uh, we recommend as maximum age 43. However, in our practical experience, we have now patient of 46 years old being pregnant after pronuclear transfer. So it's very individual, I would say. So we need to evaluate all the parameters. Of course, IMH is the most important and we would expect IMH to be present. <laughs> like, of course, this is uh, complicated, but um, we even had a patient with IMH 0.3. 0 and uh, we produced few oocytes in um, several cycles. So we did um, three or even four because one was uh, stimulation in the follicular and the luteal phase. 
and we received one to two oocytes every cycle, but she was insisting on, on this. So we, we spent a lot of time, but we ended up with uh, one euploid blastocyst after pronuclear transfer, and she's successfully pregnant now. So, but, but mainly this is up to 43, and I am age over 0 0.5. But again, this is uh, to the discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. And actually, we have a few questions on that. And there's one more from Angela. So can you do a pronuclear transfer on embryos or only oocytes to then make embryos? Pronuclear transfer on embryos on zygotes. Like to do a pronuclear transfer, we need to have a zygote. Uh, or we need to have an oocyte. We will fertilize the oocyte. And on day one, we would get a zygote uh, and the pronuclei, and we will transfer them into the cytoplasma of the of the donor oocytes. So we can do on embryos, but only on the zygote stage, and of course on the oocytes. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And one more from Karen on that: How long have the spindle nucleus treatments have been performed? I have never discovered these treatments before. In our practical experience, we do pronuclear and the spindle transfer since 2018. So this was the very first cycle. Uh, more have been performed during 2019 and 2020. Of course, this is like the, the most busiest year right now. And we, we successfully continue this, uh, this now. Uh, our clinic is a second clinic in Ukraine, which practiced this. So the first was uh, another clinic working for this with a group of uh, Chinese doctors from US. Uh, again, like China, this is quite, um, I would consider this as a location where many science is developed, but due to regulations, they cannot practice there. So they are looking for, for practical experience somewhere else, but, uh, but they were the first and they have pregnancies since also, since 2018. Uh, why? Probably because, uh, be I don't know why, like we are talking a lot already about the pronuclear transfer. Uh, so you can discover this together with us. Uh, maybe with some clinics from UK, but uh, I think that their practical experience is still quite limited. Uh, but this is a sign for me that we need to talk even more about this. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much indeed. So it's definitely interesting um, to find out a bit more on that. Um, okay, let's have a look. Okay, and the next question. Uh, what is the success rate when thawing frozen oocyte that were vitrified, sorry, donor or on egg? Success rates for the oocyte donation treatment with fresh or vitrified donor oocytes is not different at all in our center. Frankly speaking, we are using more and more um, oocytes which have been vitrified from our donor database. And we, we see the benefits of the vitrified sold oocytes because there is no synchronization and there is no risk of asynchronization between the endometrium preparation of the patient and the growth of the donor oocytes. So we should not look for the, um, uh, like, the, the solution in case the endometrium is already ready and the uh, donor is not ready yet. That's why in our hands, the survival rate of the oocytes is over 95% in our clinic from the practical experience sending the materials to different clinics. Frankly speaking, the survival rate is, is different, but it varies between 85 to 95%. Like now, and also, this, um, this experience of vitrifying the oocytes and sowing them started being widely used in 2013. Uh, and only a few clinics have been practicing this. And uh, we, we needed to get knowledges in this practical experience. And more people vitrified and sowed 
better results they are uh, receiving. And uh, all clinics which are working with us, they adapted the protocols for sewing and we work with them regarding the survival rate. So they are all doing absolutely fine. Uh, and there is no difference in terms of the fertilization rate, of the blastulation rate, of the implantation rate at all. So vitrification is very safe procedure for the oocytes and also for the embryos. But for embryos, this works already for almost 25 years and for oocytes only 10. So this is a difference. Um, and for the own eggs, um, sewing rates is uh, is different. It's lower, but it's lower depends on the age of the oocytes which were vitrified. Also, vitrification and sewing is like a test method for their potential. Mostly, if the material is not surviving the um, so sewing after the sewing, means that this was something with the material if it was not tested before. So it's a, like additional testing method for, 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 for the potential. So again, the survival rate for own eggs would depend on the quality of the eggs which were vitrified. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for yet another explanation. Okay, and now I will go to this question. As it's regarding the pre um, pro -nuclear, nuclear transfer. So can frozen eggs be used as healthy eggs? Uh, in, uh, in our laboratory experience, we used frozen eggs also for pro nuclear transfer. However, results are better using fresh. So if there is a possibility to use, use fresh, we would recommend to use them fresh. Or if there is no possibility, we would recommend. So better works if there is a created zygote and then vitrified zygote, and then this is sent to us. If we are talking about sending some kind of materials or why, why we should use frozen eggs. For the donor, because we always, for pronuclear transfer, we are using always donor materials because we need to get a cytoplasma. So all those donor materials, they are fresh. Excellent. Thank you so much for that as well. And let's have a look at the previous question. Uh, so what is the percentage of women over 45, 46 with their own eggs? And after how many different treatment options should an egg donor be considered? Uh, because those numbers are very limited, like numbers of those women over 45, 46 uh, willing using their own eggs and also having a possibility to using their own eggs because we understand that after evaluation of the patient and uh, her uh, ovarian um, um, potential and IMH uh, and after starting the stimulation and after selecting of the best protocol, if we are ending up with no follicular growth or we are ending up with one follicle, but then it is empty follicle, so there is no further treatment. We, we need to, like, frankly speaking, for many of those patients over 43, even if we are starting the stimulation protocols or the treatment uh, methods, we need to stop them in, in some cases because they, they are not working. Uh, but still there are patients and mainly those are patients with previous PCOS, with the, with the follicle, with the ovaries uh, having multiple follicles, they still are producing some oocytes and they are good responders or good uh, candidates for these uh, pronuclear transfers in their 43, 45, 46. But uh, I cannot talk, tell anything about statistics because these are individual cases. I, I can talk about the cases. Um, how many different treatment options should and egg donor be considered. So um, we are very transparent with all our patients. 
And if we see that we tried the best stimulation protocol, we selected the medication, we even for some of those patients, we did a ovarian rejuvenation before the stimulation. Uh, and if it's not working, so we just saying like, listen, and this is, it, it's very clear and transparent discussion with every patient that, um, and we, we like them to, to know this and to understand this and to be totally involved into the process. Uh, so that they, um, they, it's easier than to make a decision. There is no discussion. There is an agreement that next steps should, should be that. And many patients who even started this or they were thinking about pronuclear transfer, they ended up with the uh, oocyte donation treatment. But at least they tried, tried something different, tried an alternative. Um, and uh, for many of them, it worked. But for some, it doesn't, of course. Of course, that makes perfect sense as well. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, there are like two questions left. We will be slowly finishing. So if you have anything else that you would like to add, this is your time to do it. And let's have a look. Okay, this was uh, in regards to our kind of, I think, first question. So what might be a problem with a 5BA? Um, some embryologists have graded it on 5AB. Like 5 is already a blastocyst which is hatched. So there is zona pellucida, which is uh, a little bit ruptured, and the cytoplasma and the structures of the blastocyst are getting out. Uh, this is very sensitive embryo in terms of how all procedures with this embryo should be performed, either freezing or sewing, or even how they get it into the catheter for the embryo transfer, or even how the doctor is doing the embryo transfer, that this is not really rapid um, injection, uh, that they do not uh, stick this into the wall of the uterus, etc. cetera. Uh, and in regards to the BA or AB, um, as I said, this is, uh, if we would show even one embryo to 10 different embryologists, five of them would grade this differently from those five others. So this is the fact of the human being. Um, and they are grading, if there is two letters, they usually grade cytoplasma and, uh, and the zona pellucida differently because they are both very important and playing the role for the implantation. But in general, we would consider 5BA and 5AB as a good quality advanced uh, blastocyst. Um, but also, if there was no PGS testing of this embryo, we, we don't know everything about it. So there is still additional potential to, to get information about embryo potential by doing uh, a biopsy and, and genetic testing, which is quite widely used now. Uh, still, there is a discussion of should we do this for all or just for some, for aged blastocysts to avoid aneuploidies um, or for all not to give a false positive, false negative expectations, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, it's for, for every case, it's individual. And we also, of course, we are discussing this. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. And actually, one more question um, in regards to this. So let me show you this one. Is 4AB or 4AA good quality as well? Yes. So it's also a good quality blastocyst. So as we said, blastocyst 1 and 2, they are early, so-called early blastocyst. And everything what is 3, 4, these are advanced blastocysts. So they are good quality, but they are not hatched yet. And five, this is already hatched blastocyst. Uh, usually hatching should be performed inside of the uterus. So this is very first process before the implantation. Uh, and uh, usually embryologists, they like to work with three and four because working with five, as I said before, this is very tricky in terms of that we need to be very careful uh, with this embryo already. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the clarification to this one as well. 
And let's have a look at the next question. Now we've got what is your criteria for doing luteal stimulation following follicular stimulation? I have seen some women say that doing this has provided more eggs embryos from the luteal phase. Is this your experience? Uh, we are using random start of the stimulation quite widely, both for our patients and even for our oocyte donors. Uh, from the physiology, we understand that uh, as soon as we are having a follicle, uh, there is a potential for each for, for this follicle to produce an oocyte until a new cycle starts. So we all understand that each cycle we are given with the specific volume of the follicles, which may potentially be may potentially produce uh, the oocyte. And only once the cycle is ended, so those follicles are gone. We will not use them any time in the future. So we just we just lost them for for completely. Uh, and starting stimulation either in the follicular phase or in the luteal phase for good responders, there is no uh, no difference. Since we are giving additional FSH and since gran granulosa in the oocyte is recruited by additional FSH, which is normally produced only in the follicular phase. So that's why we were stimulating patients before only in the follicular phase because we were like um, following the natural conception, the natural cycle. And the, in the natural cycle, pituitary hypothesis is producing FSH uh, in, uh, in the higher level, only in the follicular phase. That's why we decided to provide stimulations only in the follicular phase. But now we understand that even until the next star cycle started, if we would turn on the FSH, there will be a producement of the oocyte. So there is no difference for, um, for good responders. For poor responders, how it works, that again, we have um, the ovary is producing follicles constantly until, we are, until they are there. So until the IMH, we, we still have some level of the IMH. And there is a different stages uh, the, of premature follicles. And they are getting matured with time. And even those two weeks time, there is a difference that new follicles are coming into the, from very premature stage into the stage being already responsive to FSH. And if we are giving in the luteal phase additional FSH, so we are bringing those small follicles from the premature stage into the, into the early mature being responsive to the FSH. And they are also, they are receiving this additional FSH. They are getting mature, they are growing and they can ovulate. So we can get all sides from them. And this is true that uh, we also, we are using follicular and luteal stimulation for, for different cases for uh, good responders, as I said, quite widely, for poor responders, if we have no time, if our time is very limited, for example, this is an um, advanced maternal age patient who said, like, I have only three months and I would like to get as many follicles and oocytes as possible. So of course, if there is no contraindications like cysts, uh, etc., we would perform stimulations both in follicular phase and in the luteal phase. Um, the, the difference, slight difference is that in the luteal phase, we need to give a little bit more FSH and LH. So medication volume would be a little bit higher than in the follicular phase because, because of the natural still production, uh, but it still works. So this is our experience. I think there is no other questions here inside. Thanks. Thank you so much indeed. And very, very helpful. And yeah, there are like two questions. Okay. And we will be off. So um, let's have a look. Okay. So how different is the results from using egg donation versus the spindle nucleus treatment at the age of 42? Um, <laughs> there is a, uh, the, the issue of the... Um, nuclear DNA. So still 
nuclear DNA in the aged oocyte can be changed, meaning can be unemployed. And even if we are helping with the spindle or pronuclear transfer to get the embryo into the blasted stage, it is recommended to do NGS testing uh, or PG PGS testing of the embryo because we need to be sure that um, that the DNA uh, was not affected anyhow. There was no chromosomal abnormalities there. And in comparison to that fact, if we are talking about oocyte donation, uh, and we remember this table with the lines uh, and the colors, so the probability of having euploid blastocyst from this material is higher than still getting blastocyst from the um, um, oocytes, which are older. Uh, even changing the mitochondrial DNA, we need to check the, the nuclear DNA. Excellent. Thank you so much indeed for yet another question. And one more, okay, again on the spindle transfer uh, versus so regarding prices versus egg donation, how do they compare? Yeah, so pronuclear transfer and spindle transfer are more expensive in comparison than uh, oocyte donation treatment. You can get in touch. Uh, I will forward you to our um, coordinators and they will provide all the details of course mm -hmm. excellent thank you so much for that and to one more uh, question actually uh, we got in the meantime I guess we still can answer so is there a difference in outcome during stimulation with 300 FSH compared to 350 units yeah of FSH mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I, I need additional information so if that patient is over 30 five or better 38 years old, I would not recommend pure FSH uh, in any of those dosage. So uh, for, for these patients, there should be FSH plus LH. Uh, and uh, there would be no, no critical difference between the dosage of 300 units or 350. Uh, but if that would be FSH plus LH, there would be more significant difference because LH is playing a role for getting receptors being prepared to receive FSH. That's why for all older women, like over 38, uh, we need to recommend uh, these kind of medications. Yes, yeah, over 38. Yeah. So if it was FSH and LH, and over 38, uh, there would be no significant difference between between those two stimulations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you for the clarification and of course your additional information we have provided. And I believe that was our final question of, uh, for today. So thank you so much everyone for your wonderful questions. And of course, Dr. Diana, as always, you've been very thorough with answering all the questions. So thank you so much for your time and spending this Friday evening with us again. And I also want to mention that actually Dr. Diana will be back. We will have another webinar with her um, next week, actually, on Wednesday at 8 p.m. UK time. So I hope you can already uh, register and join us then. And it's about ovarian aging. So definitely another interesting interesting topic to, to discuss. So I'm already already looking forward to it that's for sure and well Dr. Liana of course as you can see absolutely brilliant uh, presentation and thank you so much of course our, um, thank you for coming here for you as well uh, very informative very useful we join you for the next presentation yes uh, we are very happy to hear that so Dr. Liana before I let you go anything else you would like to add Thank you so much. This is my pleasure. You know, I'm missing so much this communication and uh, this is a great initiative of my IVF answers and the, the general, the team, which is doing, I know they are doing even more right now. And uh, I'm always happy to be invited. I am always happy to share our experience. And as I said, I am happy to, to practice in Ukraine. This is absolutely brilliant uh, country in terms of IVF. And uh, my will is also to, to let you know more about these possibilities and about uh, new techniques and technologies. 
uh, because so so many things are possible right now and uh, I'm so sorry to hear that sometimes people stop their trying after they did few uh, very simple rounds of IVF um, and they are totally um, like emotionally they they are feeling bad because of this because of themselves Firstly, so this is not definitely not as is uh, and we we can do more and we should do more if there is still an aim of this and uh, and the goal. So I wish you all the all the best. Uh, take care in these hard times of the COVID era. But uh, but we still we need to continue of doing IVF uh, treatments uh, because this is our future. Exactly. Thank you so much. Of course, what else can I really add to this? Um, yes, thank you so much, Dr. Liana. See you on Wednesday, of course. And well, I definitely hope to see you all here back on Wednesday as well. And of course, as you know, we will be back on Monday. Uh, so hope to see you there too. And have a wonderful uh, weekend, relaxing weekend. And of course, um, yeah. Let's stay positive, right? This is very important nowadays. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, take care. Yeah, and thank you. Bye. See you on Monday. Thank you. Bye.